Hello, my name is Brian Atkinson and welcome to UK Aircraft Explored. In this video, we shall be looking at items covered in the pilot's notes for the Spitfire Mark V's port side of the cockpit. As we work through the various items of equipment, I shall refer to extracts from the 1942 Air Ministry Manual and pilot's notes. In order to explain further, I will show you my relevant reworked colour AP diagrams to assist you. I hope you find this interesting. The automatic boost control may be cut out by pushing forward this small red painted lever mounted at the forward end of the throttle quadrant. Here is the triple push button used by the pilot for firing the machine guns and cannon on the Spitfire 5B. It's fitted with a milled finger which extends out of the bottom of the casing and is a means of locking the button in the safe position. Safe and fire being engraved on the adjacent casing. When the catch is in the fire position a pip also extends out of the top of the casing so that the pilot can ascertain by feel the setting of the triple push button. A cine camera push button is mounted on the pilot's control column just below the triple push button. The Spitfire Mark V could be fitted with either the earlier G42B or the later G45 cine camera which is fitted in the leading edge of the port main plane, as shown here. It is operated by the gun firing button on the control column spade grip, a succession of exposures being made during the whole time the button is depressed. When his Spano cannons are fitted, the cine camera is operated off the cannon firing pipeline. We shall cover more on this when we look at the G45 camera gun in much more detail in another video in this series. Moving on, in order to use the control on the carburetor, the slow running cutout is operated by pulling this ring just below on the right hand side of the instrument panel as shown here. To the left of the slow running cutout is the hand operated key gas fuel priming pump used by the pilot to prime the Merlin engine before starting and as you can see is mounted below the right hand side of the instrument panel. The fuel cock controls, one for each tank, is fitted at the bottom of the instrument panel. With the levers in the up position the cocks are open. Either fuel tank can be isolated if necessary. On later aircraft, such as the example shown here, there is only one fuel cock control. The rudder pedals have two positions for the pilot's feet and are adjustable for leg reach by rotation of star wheels on the sliding tubes. The flat at the outlet end of the radiator duct, shown here, is operated by a radiator flap control lever and ratchet on the left hand side of the cockpit. To open the flap, the lever would be pushed forward after releasing the ratchet by depressing the knob at the top of the lever. The normal minimum drag position of the flap lever for level flight is shown by a red triangle on the top of the map case fitted beside the lever. A notch beyond the normal position in the aft direction, warm air is diverted through ducts into the main planes for heating the guns at high altitude. Here's an AP diagram showing the heating duct for the guns. Next to the pilot's door on the port side of the cockpit is mounted the wedge plate. Now we can see it with the camera gun's footage indicator type 45 fitted in position on the wedge plate. The aperture switch, as shown here, enables either one of two camera gun apertures to be selected, the smaller aperture being used for sunny weather. 
A main switch for the cine camera is also mounted on the left hand side of the cockpit. The camera can also be controlled independently by means of an electrical push switch on the control column spade grip. To facilitate entry to the cockpit, a portion of the combing on the port side is hinged. The door catches are released by means of a handle at the forward end. These two position catches are incorporated to allow the door to be partially opened before taking off or landing, in order to prevent the canopy hood from sliding shut in the event of a mishap. Here are some different views of the pilot's door. Cockpit floodlights are fitted on each side of the cockpit. Each is controlled by these switches immediately below the instrument panel. The undercarriage indicator master switch for the down circuit of the indicator is mounted on the inboard side of the throttle quadrant and is moved to the on position by means of a striker on the throttle lever. This switch should be returned to the off position by hand when the aeroplane is left standing for any length of time. The up circuit is not controlled by this switch. The throttle quadrant is fitted on the port side of the cockpit. A gate is provided for the throttle lever in the takeoff position and an interlocking device between the levers prevents the engine from being run on an unsuitable mixture. Control friction adjusters for the controls are fitted on the side of the quadrant as shown here. The propeller speed control lever for the de Havilland 20 degree or Rotal 35 degree constant speed air screw is located on the throttle quadrant. The de Havilland 20 degree air screw has a positive course pitch position which is obtained in the extreme aft position of the control lever. Some aircraft are fitted with a de Havilland hydromatic propeller. The Spitfire's elevator trimming tabs are shown here. They are controlled by the elevator trimming tab hand wheel mounted on the left hand side of the cockpit. The pilot's tab indicator is fitted on the instrument panel. A metal case for a writing pad and another for storing maps and books etc. are fitted on the left hand side of the cockpit. Stowage for a height and airspeed computer is also provided below the wireless remote contactor mounted on the starboard side of the cockpit. Here we have a view of the ASI, that's airspeed indicator, heating element pressure head. It is mounted under the port wing and is controlled by the pressure head heater switch located just below the trimming tab hand wheels. It was important to ensure that the heating element was always switched off after landing in order to conserve the aircraft's battery. Here is a close up view of the rudder trimming tab. It is controlled by this small hand wheel and is located after the elevator trimming tab wheel. It is not provided with an indicator for the pilot. The Spitfire tends to turn to starboard when the hand wheel is rotated clockwise. Here is an AP diagram showing the trimming tab wheels. Whilst not fitted in any modern restored Spitfire Mark V examples, wartime aircraft were fitted with a signal discharger control toggle that was mounted around 4 inches aft of the rudder trimming tab. To operate, the pilot would need to give a sharp pull of the toggle control, which would then fire a signal cartridge 
out through a mounting point inside the rear fuselage. The signal flare would then pass out through a doped panel located at the upper starboard side of the rear fuselage, as shown here in this close-up photograph. Well, we've come to the end of another video. I hope you found this interesting. We are busy working on many more videos covering various aspects of the Spitfire Mark V. Please click the free subscribe button below and also like to get notifications when our future videos are posted. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you again next time. Bye for now.